Okay, hello everybody and welcome. Thank you for joining this uh, webinar today. Um, this event is focused on explaining the latest requirements of the FATF standards to assess and mitigate the risks of proliferation financing um, and put those in context. Um, so we've got a, an extremely strong panel today who are going to uh, go into what's required and why. Um, and before that, um, an overview of how we got here. Um, the FATF has been working on proliferation financing off and on since 2008. Uh, we've done studies of the risks of the policy options, a new recommendation in 2012, recommendation seven on implementing targeted financial sanctions and followed that up with guidance on how those limited FATF requirements are embedded in a wider context of UN obligations uh, from the Security Council, for example, activity-based financial prohibitions. Uh, but what we found through evaluations um, and through reading the reports of other bodies like the UN panels of experts is there's a major challenge in implementing targeted financial sanctions on proliferation, both weak implementation and the risk of sanctions evasion, which is much easier for um, a state which is backed by um, the ability to create legal persons and use networks of front companies. Uh, the risks of sanctions breach and evasion became very clear. So in 2018, the FATF started work on amendments to our recommendation one, which would require countries and the private sector to assess and understand and mitigate the risks of breach, non-implementation and evasion of targeted financial sanctions related to proliferation. Uh, those changes were adopted late in 2020, uh, which added some risk-based requirements to the rules-based ones that we already had. Um, and we followed that up this year with guidance. So this seminar is going to explain what those requirements mean in practice and try to show how governments and the private sector can implement them uh, in the smoothest and most direct way possible. I'm going to introduce a panel. We've got a very solid range of experts. Um, I'll start with the chairs of the two FATF working groups, which negotiated uh, and prepared the guidance um, on all of these. First, Yulia Lafitskaya from Rosfin Monitoring, the Russian FIU, who is the chair of the FATF's policy development group. Um, and Shlomit Wagman, uh, the head of the Israeli FIU and the chair of the FATF's Risks, Trends and Methods Working Group. Uh, welcome to both of you. Um, and let me also introduce a panel of experts, um, I guess the FATF's panel of experts, even though it overlaps with the UN panels of experts. We have Marion Ando, who is head of financial sanctions and counter-terrorist financing policy at the UK Treasury. Uh, we have Maiko Takeuchi, uh, who is a consulting fellow at the Research Institute of Economy, Trade and Industry in Japan and a former member of the UN Security Council DPRK Sanctions Committee panel of experts. We have Brian Grant, who is Managing Director and Global Head of Sanctions Compliance at MUFG Bank. Uh, and we have Jean-Annette de saint who is Proliferation Finance Research Center lead uh, sorry, research lead at the Center for Science and Security Studies at King's College London. So welcome and thanks to all of our panel uh, for joining us. Um, the outline of today's seminar is, um, I think, quite straightforward. I'm going to ask Shlomit and Yulia to set out the main changes and what they require um, and put those in context. And then we'll have a discussion with them and our four expert panelists on what those new obligations look like when they're being implemented. We're going to break it into three parts. Uh, the proliferation financing risk environment, what are the threats that we're trying to understand and mitigate? How to assess proliferation finance risks and how the risk assessment process works. And then third, what risk mitigation measures to apply at national and at financial institution level. Um, I hope we can learn from the hands-on experience of our panelists um, and avoid making the same mistakes that they did because nobody gets this right first time. Um, and this is going to be an interactive discussion. So we'll take questions on each of those topics as we go. 
Um, for people who do want to ask questions of our panel, there should be a Q&A box um, that you can open from the bottom of your screen. Type your questions there. Um, others can upvote the questions they most want to see answered. Um, and what we will do is, as we discuss each topic, we will try and bring in questions from the floor, and we may even call on you to ask them on screen. Otherwise, I'll be, uh, I'll be relaying them to the panel. Um, that depends on whether the technology works. Um, so first of all, let me hand over to Yulia Lefitskaya to explain the new obligations. Yulia. Uh, thank you, Tom, and it is great to be part of this uh, panel discussion. So uh, the FATF introduced new obligations uh, for countries and the private sector in October last year. And there are two uh, new requirements in recommendation one and its interpretive note, similar to the current expectation uh, for money laundering and terrorism financing risks. However, of course, with some specificities. So first, governments should identify and assess the proliferation financing risks for the country and to manage and mitigate these risks. Second, the private sector entities, such as banks and company formation services, should identify and assess their own proliferation financing risks, and they should also have policies, uh, controls and procedures to manage and mitigate these risks, which can also be done under their existing uh, risk management frameworks. Uh, this is the essence of the new obligations. Uh, just for the understanding, uh, proliferation financing risks here refers strictly and only uh, to the risk of sanctions being evaded or not implemented properly, meaning that persons and entities designated by the United Nations resolutions on DPRK and Iran or those under their control get access to funds uh, contrary to the prohibition. So what do these new requirements entail? First, uh, they do not substitute um, the strict targeted financial sanctions rules, uh, but they reinforce them. Second, uh, they do not change other existing obligations for private sector, which we call preventive measures. And finally, they do not cover broader issues of counterproliferation and activity-based prohibitions, uh, which are out of scope of targeted financial sanctions obligations under Recommendation 7 of FATF. At the same time, uh, the threat of uh, proliferation financing is growing and evolving. Uh, proliferation networks are getting smarter, uh, more sophisticated, and more widespread uh, to evade sanctions. And we cannot uh, just have a tick box approach on sanction screening for effective implementation, as was mentioned in the introduction by Tom. So we need to better understand how proliferation networks manage to obscure their identity behind a pack structure and get access to the global financial system. We should chalk this access as finance is key um, to the um, uh, key, key element uh, that supports proliferation. Um, so these amendments uh, that we introduced uh, should help us achieve this goal more effectively uh, by allocating resources where the risks are and by ensuring proper implementation of targeted financial sanctions. So I will stop here now. Uh, and look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Yulia. Um, and let me turn next to Shlomit, who can talk about the role of risk assessment in this process. Thank you very much, Tom, for the introduction. And it's a pleasure to be here uh, to exchange views with the panel on this important topic. So most of the FATF standards relay on a risk-based approach, namely that both countries and private sector firms are expected to assess the risk they face and take appropriate steps to mitigate those risks. The process of risk, assessments, of risk assessment is a fundamental first step in helping countries and private sector firms in allocating the right level of resources and applying additional controls to the highest risk areas. Yulia has just highlighted the key changes to the new FATF measures on proliferation financing risks. I would like to add that these new measures have acknowledged that sanctions evasion is a clear and present risk. Proliferation networks have become more sophisticated and therefore a tick box approach on sanction screening is not enough. 
The revision we have just adopted to the standard applied the risk-based approach for the first time to the financing of proliferation. This is a substantial change with the potential to significantly improve effectiveness, especially in the highest risk countries. We believe that both governments and private sector should work together in a true partnership to combat this threat. The FATF, the FATF expects all countries to ensure implementation of these new obligations, including by conducting their own risk assessment, providing guidance to their private sector, and sharing relevant proliferation financing related information. To help governments and private sector firms in implementing these obligations, the FATF published guidance earlier this year in June, uh, which we will discuss today. The guidance uh, gives a step-by-step -step explanation on how to prepare a proliferation financing risk assessment. In addition, it explains how different sectors and services from trade financing and correspondent banking to company formation services and virtual assets can be exploited by the wider proliferation network. Building on the FATF uh, previous work on proliferation financing typologies and risk indicators, this work has included new information on indicators suggesting the potential breach, non-implementation, or evasion of sanction requirements. These cover convention, conventional indicators on customer accounts and transaction activity profile, but also include new indicators on maritime sector and trade financing, based, based on the latest sanction evasion typologies identified by the United Nations, on some of them we will hear here today. Uh, the document also explained how governments and private sector firms can leverage on their experiences in combating money laundering and terrorism financing to proliferation financing as well. Um, so we'll hear all about it today, and I look forward to having a deep dive discussion of this issue with you all today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shwamed. Um, I think now's the time to call on, on our panel of experts. Um, let me start with looking at the global risk environment um, and the threats that we're dealing with. I want to first come to you, Maiko. Um, based on your work with the 1718 panel and, and since then, what are the main risks of proliferation financing and of breach or evasion of sanctions? Um, what are the actors and the vulnerabilities that we should be worried about? Thank you so much for your question. Yes, I, you know, so let me start with the uh, the warning message that North Korea is still using both like a new method, but also traditional method to earn foreign income, like as transfer the money, all these activities, they use both new and traditional technology uh, method. So use of the virtual and uh, cyber uh, virtual currency at, uh, assets and cyber attacks to acquire revenue are the emerging risk, new risk. North Korea is uh, using various methods to define the target, such as uh, like a targets are like say either virtual currency exchanges or financial industries and even individual computers or like uh, employees of the, the such institutes and to and extract assets or even information to you know further use it for the attack or extortion so the the method used are like a sphere phishing uh campaign against the you know so the 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 transparency industry, use of local collaborator of third countries, and use of fake ID like that. And traditional method, as I said, is to use, for example, there are at least 30 North Korean bank representatives are overseas, and some names are like in a panel report. So always a risk that, uh, that, that banks and banks customer faces can uh, be there, exist. Uh, for example, they can money transfer for the proliferation purpose, or even they, the the customer of uh, manufacturing certain sensitive devices are also uh, in a like exposed to the risk. And and also, uh, let me one thing uh, to emphasize that also part of my report emphasize on North Korea and Iran. Iran that's totally makes sense. But also, the, all the uh, threats are outside of the listed country, like the U, namely third countries, third countries collaborator. So the the risk is uh, so the 
as the already part of representative says, just a name screening is not enough, but uh, you, have, you have to do the risk assessment on the third countries too. Thank you. Thanks. That brings into very stark relief the problem that we've been facing as well, which is understanding whether Iran or North Korea is really standing behind the, the entity that you're looking at that's got a different name. Um, so that's the global picture, and the panels of experts have been the principal source that we rely on for a picture of the global risks. Um, I want to turn to Marion now um, to look at more on the national side. Um, Marion, the UK just completed a national PF risk assessment that you coordinated and led. Uh, we'll talk later about how you did it, but first, what did you find? Um, thank you, and thank you, thank you for everyone uh, for allowing me to take part in this panel. Um, so it, it's correct, we did the first um, PF NRA this year, and it was published in September. And I think if I had to give a broad summary of, of the key findings uh, in terms of uh, the DPRK and Iran PF threat that we've come across, I would say somehow, and surprisingly, the UK financial sector is at a higher risk. Um, and this is given the UK's role as a global financial centre, but we've also seen in the course of binary a bit more of an enhanced risk in the insurance and the banking sector specifically. The reason I'm saying unsurprisingly is because it's being documented in other NRA, not PF, obviously money laundering and terrorism financing risk that we've done, that what makes the UK financial sector attractive for businesses is also what makes it attractive to illicit financing actors, including PF actors. So the range of products and financial services, this is something that we've documented as well and that we found as well in the PF NRA. So it's just backing up that kind of um, risk across both MLPF and PF. Um, I'm not going to go into the detail because obviously the, the NRA report is out there for everyone to read, but some of the linkages that we've seen with respect for the financial sector, we've come across some threads of proliferation sensitive items who's happening in the UK or abroad, but whose payments were being processed in part or wholly in the UK. So that's one of the linkages. We've also seen some proliferation activity of financing actors interacting with the UK system through local branches and subsidiaries of financial institution headquarters in the UK. So that's some of the example, but I said, it's not exhaustive there. There's more in the report. I would say there are other risk and vulnerability, uh, which are slightly similar to the global financial uh, sector angle. And I'm saying similar because I'm talking about the global defense sector and the UK as a global education hub. It's similar in the sense of the size and the international facing nature of the sector. And obviously the global defense sector, this, uh, the product offer as well in itself um, is, is uh, at higher risk. In our research, uh, we found that PF factor were targeting specifically mid medium-sized firm in the defense sector. And I think that's based on the vulnerability we identified that the manufacturing sector potentially has lower awareness of sanctions and, and the regulatory framework, including export control in that space. And finally, uh, one of the risks, and I would say more vulnerability that we identified, is a lower awareness of PF risk typologies, et cetera, in the private sector compared to MLCF. It's not something we're necessarily surprised, it's something that the FATF itself is trying to address by, within the requirements, but I think it was something that we got confirmed through our interaction with the private sector in the roundtable, and I'll come to that later in the process. But, but that's kind of a round robin of, of the main findings from our report. Okay, thank you. So one of the takeaways I have from reading this is, is countries don't have to be involved in goods trade or near countries of concern to have quite significant risks. And for you, it's the global payments system and parts of that that are rooted through London that, that are the biggest risk. That's a, a very blatant segue to talk to Brian now. Um, Brian, you're from one of the banks that's at the centre of the global payments system, um, and you've been looking at the risks for a number of years. Uh, when you did this internally, what did you see as the biggest risks affecting your activity? Sure, thanks, Tom. I think my fellow panellists have hit on the key elements of the, the proliferation finance uh, risk, which really is when you're talking about proliferation finance, what we're really talking about are Iran and North Korea. And these are targets that have been subject to 
sanctions in one form or another for a very long time. In the case of North Korea, we're talking 70 years in the US. In the case of Iran, we're talking 40 years in the US. And of course, layered on top of US restrictions are UN and other multilateral sanctions. So these are hard targets. These are jurisdictions that know what they're doing. They're used to scrutiny. They don't do business in their own name. So a number of panelists have mentioned that sanction screening, uh, list-based screening is not going to save you here. It's not. And really, frankly, as a control, it's of rather limited utility here. These networks are complex. They are using, as pointed out in the guidance that FATF issued, many of the basic tools that other illicit actors are using, money launderers, for example, shell companies, intermediaries, secrecy havens, and that sort of thing. On top of that, you also have a lot of the inputs into a proliferation program are from a sort of pure commercial standpoint, they can be rather benign. When you're talking about dual use goods, you're talking about things that um, often don't raise the eyebrow. There are thousands of, of dual use because there's been a lot of talk about dual use goods out there, which is, which is good and helpful, but for a financial institution, which is not actually a party to the underlying commerce, it can be quite tricky when you have things like scuba gear, computers, video game consoles, things like that being on the list of uh, dual use goods. Things can hide in plain sight. So, um, you know, this set against what banks can see. So when I was in government, I had access to a rich trove of intelligence, human intelligence, other kinds of intelligence that sort of allowed me to understand a network in its totality. As a bank, we, we don't have that, right? We have financial activity. We have what we know about our customers. We can, based on the tools that we have, the tools that have been developed in the international community and major banks over the last several decades, we can identify unusual activity and we can report that activity. We can exit that activity, but oftentimes we'll never really ultimately be able to know whether or not there was fire accompanied with the smoke that we identified. So these are some of the challenges. We'll get to it later. There are things you can do about it. It is by no means hopeless, but of you know, all the, the, the threats that a financial institution faces, you know, arguably proliferation finance you know, is the most challenging and potentially the most significant in terms of the, um, you know, the threat to international security that it represents. Thanks. That's a, a useful perspective on just how, how hard it is to see through the haze on some of these issues to find out what's really going on. I want to turn now to a research perspective. Um, Jean Annette, you've been looking at proliferation issues and proliferation financing issues embedded within them. Um, how does your research bear out what you've just heard from, from our other experts? And are there any other things that we should be worried about? Well, thank you very much, Tom. And, 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 and very, uh, uh, and, and a warm thank you to, to be a member of that. Uh, of this panel, um, so I, I conquer uh, absolutely with um, with all panelists um, in in a way uh, we would be blind if we limit ourselves to uh, 239 uh, designations uh, under Iran and BPRK sanctions. Um, so th this threat uh, for uh, proliferation finance is broader than that. And and by the way, recommendation one tend to expand that scope of actor and, and, and to look beyond uh, sanctions. So there are other actors that are not designated, um, uh, leveraging uh, third countries that are not under a, a security council uh, regime. Um, th there's also, I think for me, a, a threat perspective, a, a, a stepping stones looking from an actor perspective, which is the purpose of designation, but also on activity-based uh, approach. What Marion said about dual use goods, for instance, um, this uh, this might be the sort of ideal type of, uh, of proliferation finance uh, transactions, the the uh, the payment or the financial leg of a procurement of something very sensitive to, um, uh, to, to go into a weapons of mass destruction program. Uh, there might be an analogy here with uh, the organized crime. It's not because uh, it, it's, uh, um, we, we focus on, on the payment, but what, what 
what this uh, criminal organization is doing elsewhere. So there's, there's also uh, some other activities and, and, and the FATF could raise, move and use fund. And we tend to, to look at the idle type of uh, use funds for the procurement of a dual use good. But there's, uh, there's raising funds in terms of uh, uh, um, North Korean activities reported in panels saying hacking, uh, bank theft, uh, robberies, uh, uh, workers, uh, Center Brown. So, so th this is the purpose of collecting money for uh, for North Korea. There's moving fund. I mean, there's, there's an extraordinary amount of money uh, 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 going uh, across jurisdiction. Um, um, the the panel of experts on, the, on North Korea reported that uh, very little of that money goes back to the PRK. So th this money must be somewhere. Um, and so th this uh, this issue of moving money is uh, uh, in, in other jurisdictions is is uh, is called a PF threat as well. And and when we speak about using funds, uh, there's the procurement uh, obviously, but it also other type of uh, activity that um, proliferation network might might uh, use money for. Like um, uh, we we spoke uh, earlier about maritime, so transport, insurance. So there are different types of uh, of activities that are. Of concern in, in terms of PS threats. Okay, thank you. So there's a lot of activity, and it's not necessarily crossing the border of Iran or DPRK. Um, it's it's remote from there. Um, we've heard a lot about the what of the risks, um, but not about the how. Um, maybe I can turn back to to Maiko and then Marion. What are some of the cases that you've seen of sanctions evasion? Sure, uh, let me start. So like, uh, as you say, like financial and the shipping industry and also the manufacturing industry are all vulnerable. So uh, for example, financial industry, uh, one case we had is uh, the, the after the, con it's like a third country to third country transaction. And one case, once these uh, manufacturer and buyer Made a con made a contract, and suddenly to the manufacturer, there's another third country payers who pay, and that's suddenly this company came into the contract. So and then, but uh, this payer of the, the another third country was actually connected connected to North Korea. So the so maybe the the buyer may be also related to the cases, but for the uh, for the banking as for the bank side send money from payers account to this manufacturer. It's just uh, like a low, smaller amount of uh, 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 money order to another non-sanctioned country. So it's very difficult for the, for the banks to kind of know that without having the KYC like of the payers, of the lo local payers. So another example is a mar maritime section that the chartered uh, ships are used for uh, petroleum products ship to ship transfer that was uh, prohibited under the UN sanction. But so that case, like a actually financial records are a good clue to find out what's, uh, what's behind, who is behind that because like a, so the time, char time chartering or other uh, particular custom in the industry makes uh, tracing very difficult. And financial record is one clue to do that. And of course, like a manufacturers of sensitive items, as just uh, Brian mentioned, there's uh, one of the biggest risk too. And that, that case particularly uh, concern is, there's a case that the North Korea tried to procure the sensitive items which are traditionally made only smaller amount, smaller uh, like-minded country, but now because of the overall level improvement of the level of the industry, other country under the radar can make it and North Korea can procure it. So these are the risks I found during the, in the, in the panel. Thank you. Thank you. And, and that's, I think, just representative of a lot of other cases behind them. Uh, Marion, what are the most common evasion typologies that you've seen in the UK? Um, so you would have seen from the, the NRA, there's a lot of case studies that we included that, that, that speaks to many type of, uh, many typologies to evade sanctions. It's unsurprising, and we've mentioned, and some of the other panelists mentioned it, it's unsurprising that some of them are exact, are the same that are being used for other illicit finance, uh, illicit financing channels for, ML. And I think what I have in mind specifically there is anything 
to blur the payment channel in a way and to hide the mass entity. So um, we have many examples in NRA of front and cell companies being used um, in particular to carry out uh, procurement business where do your um, good items uh, are being purchased. We have complex financial network being set up with intermediaries to hide the end user and the recipients. And uh, we see the end user and recipient or the benefit of that is a designated person. And uh, we've seen an increased trend in, and that was mentioned by other panelists, and I'm really sorry, I can't remember who, but in crypto and cyber, um, and there's a, a marked trend in, in that space as well. Other typology that are, I would say are potentially less, um, not necessarily using MSF context, but more PF specific. We have seen a lot of um, tools used to falsify documents. Um, and obviously that can be used for money laundering, but obviously this is more in the shipping maritime insurance context with GP at the end of it. Uh, so falsification of document to mask sanctioned entities. Uh, we've seen some cases where this was used to obtain insurance for uh, a sanctioned uh, Iran entity, I think, in that case. Um, and then we have very specific maritime issues. So we've seen ship to ship transfer uh, and the associated document that goes with that and the financial transaction that goes with that and potentially falsification, the falsifying of document that I just mentioned all looked into one to mask, um, uh, to mask the end destination and the end use. So we have ship A transferring some goods, ship B arrive at C and C for no transfer some of the goods, the related documentation that goes with that, that is falsified and hide the payments and the end recipient, and then the logic back to into DPRK port. So that's some of the typology that, that we've come across. And I think that there's quite a lot of uh, case studies that we included in the NRA that speak to those. Okay, thank you. And, and one of the things that comes out very clearly from the risk assessment is these typologies are ways to avoid detection. And it's not easy for anyone involved to see them. Um, that's one of the reasons that the FATF worked on risk indicators. And I want to turn now to Shlomit. Um, your working group tried to develop risk indicators to help people identify sanctions evasion. Can you tell us what those are and, and how to use them? Thank you very much, uh, Tom. So indeed, at the RTMG working group, uh, we believe that the understanding of risk indicators would help both government and private sector counterparts to better identify potential activities of sanction evasions. And as we've just seen, it is indeed required to better continue understanding that. Uh, the FATF has produced proliferation financing risk indicators in 2008 and then in 2018. And now most recently, the updated guidance that we're discussing in June 2021. The indicators that are provided in uh, the guidance, uh, uh, pages 17 uh, and until 21 or so, if, if someone is interested to, to, to look at uh, that when we are speaking, uh, they are drawn from typologies identified by member jurisdiction uh, and cases as you've just heard uh, now. Uh, we have noted that a number of typologies identified in 2008 remain exactly the same. However, the level of the sophistication has increased over time. Uh, for example, we see an increased use of proliferators and their wider networks in more complex company ownership structure, additional number of front companies headquartered in different countries in order to hide ownership or the financial transactions once they have been designated by the Security Council. Uh, some proliferators have also branched out and made use of more novel methods uh, to evade from detection by authorities. And um, uh, I think that we've just heard by, by uh, Maiko and, and Mariano and Marion uh, um, uh, some of those recent typologies. So I would repeat, uh, so I wouldn't uh, repeat them here, but what I want to add to uh, the conversation here uh, is the new development and the new finding uh, by the panel of experts uh, that the FATF has also prepared an updated list of indicators. So the updated, the new methods that we've uh, recognized, uh, we added uh, two main areas. First is the maritime sector, following uh, the sanction evasion typologies as identified by uh, the DPRK panel and the new DPRK related sanction obligations, which was uh, highlighted earlier. And in addition, the second uh, category that was added uh, for the indicators was with respect to trade financing. Uh, 
uh, that was uh, done following the designation of trading companies by the United Nations Security Council. I would like to add uh, to the discussion uh, something about the way uh, the utility of the indicators and the way that uh, it should be uh, make use of them, specifically um, um, uh, on how to do the best use of them. Like any other risk indicators, the presence of one single indicators would not automatically suggest a sanction uh, breach but to drive governments and compliance officers in the private sector to conduct additional monitoring or further examinations. Whether one or more of the indicators indeed suggest proliferation financing, it also depends on the business line, the product or services that the institution offers. So uh, we need to check that carefully. And last but not least, we should also remember that even if the identification of risk indicators may not point towards a seizure or freezing of funds uh, for proliferation financing uh, co concretely, a solid understanding of, understanding of the indicators will also help to better understand the wider risks and uh, mitigate them uh, in the future. Okay, thank you very much, Lamed. That's, that's important because the risk indicators are one of the starting points for all of the activity um, that financial institutions are doing to, um, to spot this. We want to take questions from the floor now, um, particularly on the underlying risks and the risk environment. Um, there are a couple of process ones that I can answer. Um, we are limiting the scope of this seminar to proliferation financing, uh, which we mean in relation to sanctions on Iran and North Korea. Uh, so we're not going to go wider than that. Um, there aren't notes or slides available, but this whole webinar is being recorded, live streamed, and should be available afterwards on YouTube for anyone who wants to watch it again, if it's that good. Um, though um, maybe there are more exciting things there also. Um, on the methodology, we're working on this as we speak, and probably the February or June FATF plenary will announce the revised methodology but we're not going to start doing country assessments of these new obligations until the next round of evaluations, which depending on the progress of the COVID pandemic might be in 2025 or 2024, or even later if there is a new variant that stops the evaluation program we're still in the middle of. Um, with that said, I want to come to one of the questions from, I think it's uh, Rene Castro. Um, who says it seems that most governments don't understand the proliferation financing risks and don't identify dual use assets. How can governments really identify the risks in order to facilitate the private sector's compliance as well? Um, and we also had a question on whether banks are submitting suspicious transaction reports on this. Uh, maybe we can take both of those. Let me start with you, Jean Annette. Well, uh, thank you. Um, thank you, Tom. Um, so on, on cases, uh, so the second question, uh, I'd say that this, um, that this very rare um, uh, suspicion, uh, suspicious activity report uh, directly linked to, uh, to proliferation finance. And in most cases uh, I've, uh, I've seen, when there's a, there's a suspicious activity report, it's uh, either filed because there's a there's a, there's a suspicious behavior behavior or on probably a more money laundering uh, uh, aspect. So so there's this uh, not direct uh, um, proliferation finance activity identified uh, in the uh, at the beginning. Um, so so uh, that that might be actually a challenge, and I guess uh, we'll, we'll talk about that later in, in, in the in the panel. On the first question, uh, which is um, what are the risks um, uh, in, and how country might understand risk? Um, well, that that's um, uh, I think the uh, the purpose of the of the uh, of the recommendation in terms of. Uh, inviting countries to make a proper uh, uh, assessment of their exposure to proliferation finance and in, in going beyond uh, the implementation of, of, of sanctions. And we mentioned, for instance, uh, dual-use goods earlier. 
And Julius good earlier would present the idle type of a proliferation finance transaction. And, and some countries might not feel exposed to, uh, to Julius good and private sector might say, well, we, we, we don't have the technical knowledge for that. And, um, and I think this, the risk assessment has the view to, to bridge that gap and to say, well, this is how we should understand uh, Julius Goods. And that's how we trade Julius Goods. And that, that's the, the licensing process. And invite private sector um, to have a better understanding about Julius Goods uh, international transactions and, and, and know who to reach out in, in their own governments. That's helpful. So, so even though we're only concerned about the the bit of the iceberg that's sticking up out of the water, which is the targeted financial sanctions, it can be, it can be helpful to understand the ice that's underneath the surface, which is the, the dual use goods regime, all of the trade, all of the risky materials. Um, let's come to Brian for a quick answer on, on both of those questions. What can governments do to give a good understanding of the risks and also the STR reporting question? Sure. I'll start with STR reporting, and Jean Anet really hit the nail on the head there. In, in, the, in the quite rare instance where we have a, a genuine you know, instance of proliferation financing, yes, certainly we would file an STR. Indeed, if we had one of the listed entities, we would probably even be blocking and reporting. So there would be a host of, of filings, and we would probably also talk to government authorities about the sort of surrounding network and what we discovered in the course of our investigation. That is a comparatively rare situation where you have that level of certainty. Most of what you see is suspicious activity involving higher risk jurisdictions, higher risk types of uh, industry sectors, companies, and you know there'll be smoke. We don't know if there's fire, and we will file an STR and if you know potentially take other measure, measures, including business restrictions, exit, that kind of a thing. Um, with respect to what can governments do in the conversation around dual use, governments have done quite a bit on dual use goods and I, you know, almost too much in a sense, there are thousands of dual use goods identified, right? And when there are thousands of things identified, practically speaking for a bank that's not party to the underlying transaction, not hugely helpful. What is helpful is identifying, uh, you know, a more limited subset of proliferation sensitive goods that we can act on, that we can use to um, inform our risk analysis of customers and transactions, um, and, and, and also sort of accompanying typologies, right? Information on, 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 on those sorts of things, the, the, the types of jurisdictions, customers, products and services that present risk that we can then programmatize a control around. Thank you. Yes, it's a point that I've heard from financial institutions many times before, because the dual use goods list is bigger than the London telephone directory. Um, it's not easy to get to grips with, um, and I couldn't tear it in half. Um, we haven't covered all of those questions, but, but they're actually related to our next topic, which is the practice of risk assessment and how you do them. So maybe we can cover those other questions in the next session and move on. Um, I want to turn first to uh, Marion. Risk assessment is one of the main obligations on countries and companies uh, under the new standards. And there's an expectation that countries need to go first so that the results of their risk analysis can be the starting point for financial institutions. Um, so how did you approach the UK's proliferation finance risk assessment? And what were the biggest challenges that you found? Um, I completely agree. Uh, obviously that government needs to go first. We need to break the cycle of lack of information. So um, and just to highlight from the outset that we see very much this as an iterative process. The, the NRA is not the end of the road, it's just the first steps into um, increasing that awareness and, and, and having knowledge about risk, threat, vulnerability and typologies. Um, so uh, my answer is gonna be quite processy because we're asking how we, we went about it. So I would say the first starting point that we had always is to look at our experience, because we've done several national risk assessment, but look at the experience on the money laundering and terrorism financing side and use that as a benchmark. It doesn't necessarily read across given the nature of the, of the risk and the threat, but that was uh, one of the, the body of, of expertise or experience that we could build on. Um, I would highlight four phases uh, in the report. Obviously the first one is very much about the scope and the methodology we were gonna use. So we spent quite a lot of time uh, defending that scope, obviously, with the focus being on the threat from Iran and, and DPRK. And, and we found it quite helpful to, to 
split some of the activity into direct activity and indirect activities that goes slightly to typology as we mentioned above with the direct activity this is where we include the link directly between the proliferation financing activity and the proliferation actor which as we've just discussed um is is a bit now now the, the easiest identifying route where actually the indirect link is where the indirect activity is where a lot of the typology are happening which involves more obscure links such as network of front companies and intermediaries as I just as I just discussed in the previous discussion. I think the next step is very much to build the body of evidence and that is a key step without that evidence gathering then the analysis might fall short. So we have obviously evidence across government. We, we know who our proliferation and proliferation financing experts are within government, our law enforcement, our proliferation uh, needs that engage with the UN side. So we tapped actually into those, creating almost like a virtual team just to exchange views and ideas. Um, we, we went out to experts, uh, Jean-Annette included uh, in that. Uh, we engaged quite a lot with Russi as well. Um, so just casting the net as wide as possible in terms of the intelligence that we have in-house, uh, within government, and then the expertise out there. And obviously we held some round tables with private sector and, and private firms. Um, and that kind of allowed us just to, to build that, that body evidence. I would say that case studies um, of law enforcement were with a rich source of, uh, of information for us. The next step obviously is the assessment of the evidence and we went back also to the people we engage with. Uh, there was a lot of follow-up on a bilateral basis on the back of the round table with the private sector for the engagement with Ruthie and Jean, uh, and Jean Annette uh, amongst other academic experts uh, and, and making sure that we were, the analysis we were doing were chiming with what, with what we were saying uh, and allowing them time to kind of um, question. The way we analyze um, the evidence that we had, we went through sector by sector, we went by geographical risk, which I haven't touched that much on in previous um, interventions that other panelists have, geographical link networks that we were seeing, um, sector renewability, I mentioned education, maritime, insurance banking. So all the analysis was listed in different aspects. And obviously the final step, is dissemination and publication. We're still very much into the dissemination stage. We still think there more we can do. And we're very much also in the lessons learned stage and getting ready to apply those lessons learned for the next iteration of the NRA. Great. So, so that's how it works in a country that's got maybe quite a lot of history and, and capacity in this area. I want to turn to Jean Annette because one of the things that you've been doing is working with some of the, the smaller countries and developing countries on their risk assessments. Um, what are the challenges that they're facing when they try and do the same thing? Um, uh, well, th th it's a broad qu question. I'll, I'll try to, um, um, uh, to hit on, on three main points here. Uh, first, as, uh, as Marion said, there's, there's a, a, a challenge uh, behind uh, scoping and uh, understanding what proliferation finance is about. So uh, basically uh, uh, um, uh, highlighting the fact that uh, um, a proper risk assessment is a, a just a bit beyond, uh, is more complex than just applying uh, recommendation seven. You, you need, as, as you pointed out, uh, Tom, earlier, uh, there's the tip of the iceberg, but uh, what 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 sunk the the ship was what was below the uh, the tip of the iceberg. Uh, so so that's part of the understanding of of proliferation patterns. Um, there's a, a, a review exposure to country of proliferation uh, concerns. So what do they consider a, a country of proliferation of proliferation uh, uh, concern? Do they go beyond uh, North Korea and and Iran, for instance? And there's also a strategic trade uh, um, uh, uh, trade concern. Are they exposed with dual use goods? What what type of activity? So so, so that's part of the understanding or, and scoping of uh, of, uh, of proliferation finance. The second aspect is uh, is rather good news is uh, interagency, um, and and that's bringing uh, governments and different parts uh, or agencies together because uh, in in, in many cases, answer to those uh, scoping question are already in government. And it's really about 
uh, connecting different galaxies. Um, so uh, from a financial perspective, we speak about treasury, regulators, uh, but when we talk about proliferation, we talk about uh, licensing agency, customs, uh, defense security, and connecting those, those different bodies into uh, interagency work uh, on many times, uh, uh, try to uh, manage this to, 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 to uh, leverage some, some answer to the scoping question. And the last challenge, uh, which uh, probably hit on, on Yulia's uh, introductory uh, point, is uh, it has to be relevant. Uh, so, so there's no uh, one-fits-all uh, approach, and it has to be relevant to, to one particular jurisdiction. So there's no toolbox or punch list, uh, and, and any jurisdiction has its own vulnerability. And I think the quality uh, of uh, of the risk assessment will be highly dependent on on the self reflection uh, the 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 authorities might have on on their own vulnerability. Thanks. Um, let's turn to the private sector now. Um, so we've heard how governments, big and small, are doing their risk assessments. Um, Brian, how does MUFG organize its risk assessment on PF? Um, and how does it relate to the other risks that you're worried about, like money laundering and terrorist financing? Sure, great question. The key thing is for an institution, and this largely applies to banks, although probably to, to a lesser extent, other types of actors, is to have a financial crimes risk assessment program. And the operative words there are financial crimes and program. When I say financial crimes, I mean the, the spectrum of illicit finance risk. So you have to have a process that's looking at not just money laundering, which will sort of get up your indicia of suspicious activity, but also critically economic sanctions, right? You have to have a methodology that looks at economic sanctions that, that is informed by uh, knowledge of uh, sanctions evasion typologies, oftentimes sanctions is looked at merely as list screening. So the only questions that are asked and answered in a risk assessment process relate to screening lists. But as we've talked about, these targets of sanctions are not doing business in their own names. They're not doing business necessarily out of Iran or North Korea. They're doing business through third party jurisdictions. So do you have a methodology that identifies different jurisdictions that present a heightened proliferation finance evasion risk? Is that informed by analysis? Is it, is it documented? Have you identified industries and sector types that, that present heightened risk? Is that documented? There is a lot of good information that's been put out by various governments, uh, UN panel of experts, Japanese governments put out things, there are NGOs, uh, you know, C4ADS and those sorts of organizations that do put out information that allow an institution to have a, a view of those things. I also mentioned the word program. So there has to be a structure around this process. You have to have dedicated resources. You have to have that written methodology, which encompasses uh, sanctions considerations. You have to have engagement with your first line of defense, with your business owners, so they understand what you're talking about, what the purpose is. They own the data, right? From a, a, in a bank perspective, all your transaction data, your customer type data, that doesn't come from compliance. That comes from your business leaders. They have to understand, they have to buy in, they have to participate in the collection of data. And then one last thing I would say, we, often, we, we spend much of our time, most of our time talking about risk assessments, capital R, capital A, risk assessment, the exhaustive and exhausting annual process. And that's great, you have to have that. But what about risk assessments, small R, small A, things that you do on a targeted basis when you have new information put out by the government, looking at a particular jurisdiction, looking at a particular class of transactions. That is hugely helpful in few institutions really have a program around that. And let's not forget about that. Thanks, that bears out my experience. Building a network of people who you can talk to about this is probably the most difficult, but the most important part. Um, now, Marion, one of our panelists is time limited. So I want to come back to you before you have to leave. Um, I had two questions really. What's the biggest challenge that you found when you were trying to gather evidence for the risk assessment, but also on the results? Did you find any risks that weren't already being mitigated? And what are you doing to, to mitigate any surprise risks that you found? 
So on the biggest challenge, I would highlight two. Um, the first one is sort of a, a bit of a chicken and the egg, and I, I just mentioned it, I mentioned that earlier, it's a bit of a vicious cycle where when we engage with the private sector, we had confirmation there was no awareness, so we get less information, and they are the first line of defense on many things, so we get less information from them, and it, it, it creates this kind of vicious cycle that the NRA is partly there as a first step to break, but they need more steps and more engagement. And we can, I can go that into the mitigation step in terms of public-private sector partnership that needs to be uh, beefed up in, in a way. Um, the other challenge I think we had, I mentioned earlier how invaluable enforcement cases were in the NRA to focus on typology, identify some risk and avenues and networks, et cetera. I think um, it, it is invaluable resource and it also confirm it goes also to effectiveness and demonstrating what enforcement is doing in that space. But we were very mindful of not having a confirmation bias or seeing more of what enforcement is already identifying and being blindsided. I think the biggest challenge we had at all time is that how, do we have a blind spot that we're not aware of? Is there a threat that we're not talking about and identifying, which is also um, accentuated potentially by the lack of awareness from the private sector and the lack of feedback compared to the conversation we're having on MN and TF with them. Um, and I would say that, just to go back to the, um, the awareness points, the round table that we had were not, the conversation were not at, as freed as the one that had been on to for ML and TF. So the, the, one of the lessons that I would say is the, the, the follow-up conversation we had, and given the sensitivity of the topic, some of the um, private sectors engagement that we had, they were more comfortable on the bilateral basis to exchange some of the some of the um, typology that they've come across or the risk that they had come across. Um, do you want me to branch out on mitigation right away? Yes, if you do, otherwise we might not hear about it. So I think my intervention on mitigation is is a bit, it's not as conclusive as the other one in the sense that we're still working through the next step. Uh, we still, we were very much in the dissemination phase of the NRA and we're still very much working what to do. However, I would like to highlight that obviously the, the NRA uh, confirmed that the, the regime that we have in place, the DPRK run sanction area is quite robust and enforcement is quite effective. So we're not planning a revamping of the system as such, but we need to keep it under review. And we have actually right now consulting on the change to the money laundering regulation to make sure that private sector is also carrying out their own PF risk assessment. We know in some financial institutions it's already happening, but just to make that long story. Um, that being said, and going back to the vicious cycle point I made earlier, we, we definitely do want to use the NRA as a springboard to increase awareness. This is a key vulnerability that we need to, to, um, to address. And I think the way of doing that is really look at the public-private sector partnership that we have in place on PF, strengthening those, broadening those. Um, this is, um, we, we, we looked at, so Jim Litt, which is, um, for those who've read the UK uh, mutual evaluation report, Jim Litt is quite present there. We've used Jim Litt, it's a partnership between the public and private sector to share intelligence. And we've used them uh, in, in PF case, but there's a question of how, what much can we do on a systematic basis and what other avenues we can, we can um, develop to strengthen that partnership and make the second iteration of the NRA even more user-friendly because that's how it how it's all about. It needs to be user-friendly for financial institutions, maritime sector, etc., to uh, to be of value. Okay, thanks. That's a that's a very useful perspective, and it it seems actually getting the information on the risks out there is one of the biggest things you can mitigate the risks in itself. Um, I want to come back to Schlamit now. Um, because we've got the having a head of FIU on the panel. And, and with that background, what sources of information do you rely on when you're looking at the proliferation financing risks? Thank you so much. So as the head of FIU, I'm also in charge uh, on leading uh, my country's national risk assessment. So I have both perspective on that. And I, uh, I agree with, uh, with uh, Echoes Mariano's uh, observations and comments. So first, we would look on conventional sources of information, uh, exactly like on money laundering or terrorism uh, financing cases. This is very useful and relevant. Uh, it includes financial intelligence, no, law enforcement data, information contained in the suspicious transaction reports, 
previous uh, investigations and so forth. We are also uh, need to look into documents that from other agencies, for example, customs document, customs declarations, company information documents, and additional information which is available nationally in our registries. Uh, in this topic, we also expanded to additional governmental counterparts. They are not always the usual suspects at the money laundering and terrorism financing uh, cases. We also have Ministry of Trade, of Commerce, and other counterparts that they have a very useful information and registry at their hand. Um, and often, it is important to mention that um, it's not the picture does not immediately reveal the apparent proliferation financing related activities, but we need to build the relevant information in order to have the overall picture of threats and vulnerabilities and from that to uh, being able to going forward. Um, of course, information from the private sector is essential, uh, including uh, transaction and customer information, which was obtained during the due diligence uh, process on transaction monitoring. And uh, we need uh, basically a lot of information in order to, to, in order to gather all of that. Um, it's a good opportunity to uh, mention that in our guidance, we have included uh, more examples on potential sources of information that can be used by uh, all the stakeholders for that process. I refer that to, to the guidance again. Thank you. Um, that's very useful. I, a few of the panelists have talked about relying on, on UN um, panel of expert reports as a starting point or an essential input to all of the risk assessments. And I want to come back to Maiko. I know you can't speak for the panel now, um, but do you think the panels of experts have got all of the support and, and input that they need to play the role now that, we're, uh, now that we're asking them to play a much bigger role and we're putting quite a lot of weight on their outputs? Uh, what do you think they need to, uh, to step up and, and fulfill the expectations we're placing on them? Thank you so much for the question. Yeah, like for the uh, my personal observation, panel is more resources and information. The resource issue, it's like maybe beyond the, the what the issue, but uh, the resource information resources, the panel needs more uh, full disclosure by the member states, and also member states should encourage the the companies who got involved into. Uh, show the information because what's most important is not just uh, the the name of the companies or what's the that the item who got uh, procured that's also important to know what sensitive item are needed but also who is behind who what's their modus operandi and how these bad actors try to uh, disguise their purpose and they try to get the the material from innocent companies. So the whole chain of the information is very important for the panel. And then the encouragement by the member states to, you know, that and also contribution by the member states is a very valuable asset, I believe. Thanks. So, so if we're lucky, then the national risk assessments and the private sector risk assessments are going to feed uh, better chain of information into the UN panel that, that gives us a better picture globally. Um, that might be quite important in the long run. Um, I've been looking at the questions people have been typing in the Q&A. There are seven or eight which are all on similar topics, and I'm going to try and summarize them and then ask Brian on the spot to answer them. Several people are asking, what's the difference between a a proliferation financing risk assessment and a more traditional money laundering and terrorist financing risk assessment. Um, and do they have to be separate or can they be integrated? So my view on this is that they can and should be integrated. What you're going for is a holistic financial crimes risk assessment. Remember, when we talk about proliferation finance, we're talking about typologies and techniques that are common between proliferators and other illicit financial networks. We're talking about use of intermediaries, front companies, secrecy havens. We're talking about sanctions evasion, right? Proliferation finance in this context is very much about Iran and North Korea. So if you have a sanctions risk assessment as part of your financial crimes um, risk assessment program that covers these risks, 
that should get you where you need to go from a proliferation finance standpoint. I think we as a community have to be vigilant to um, not have a, a growth of bespoke risk assessments around every risk strike, especially when the techniques and tech and, and typologies used by illicit actors are, are generally speaking shared, right? You, 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 you don't want to silo things. You want to have an, a, a holistic and integrated view. But as I said earlier, the risk assessment process has to contemplate sanction specific risks, proliferation finance specific risks. Great, thank you. I'm looking at the panel to see if others have, have thoughts on that question briefly. Jean Annette. Well, ju just a quick word to, to echo Brian's points about uh, whether we can uh, mix the, 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 the risk assessments. Uh, um, th there's, um, uh, I think, proliferation finance, especially from a government perspective or national risk assessment, uh, hit on, on different branches of, of, of government, government and, and as such, uh, they, they need to be uh, uh, to, to go in, in, in uh, other direction than a, a, a traditional money laundering and terrorism finance uh, uh, risk assessment. And uh, they, they, they might be a risk uh, that uh, government misunderstands uh, proliferation finance as a subset of uh, another illicit finance activity and so sort of downgrade proliferation finance within uh, traditional risk assessment. Well, I think the, the FATF uh, uh, intention with uh, uh, the, the new recommendation is that proliferation finance is actually the risk we want to, uh, to assess, not a set risk uh, to, to another one. And, and so from a government perspective, I think they, 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 they must uh, gather uh, the different uh, uh, government agency around the PFI assessment. Okay, thank you. And Shlomit, you had a reflection on this. Yes, a quick reflection. Uh, in addition to Brian, I actually think that it should be a separate uh, exercise. It could be it could be done at the same time as the general exercise. But our experience shows that different experts are required and different attention is required. And therefore, we've also separated in Israel the money laundering and terrorism financing. And we intend to create a, a different uh, asset risk assessment for proliferation financing to make sure that it intercorrects with the national risk assessment, but to give that uh, the special team that is required. Right. So there are two ways of doing it. Um, truly, it depends on whether you're looking at the same experts or not. And maybe in the private sector you are, and in the public sector, I know from experience, the proliferation experts speak a completely different language to the money laundering experts. <laughs> I think now we're a little behind time, but I want to move on to the risk mitigation side of the picture. Um, I know we've heard from Marion already um, about what the UK is doing on risk mitigation, which is because she may have to drop off at any moment. Um, so thank you, Marion. Um, what I want to do is turn to Brian now on the private sector side. What tools do you have in your toolbox for mitigating the risks once you found them? Sure. I mean, I would start by saying with risk mitigation, it's critical to get the big things right. And when I say big things, you have to have a, I think, firm wide approach, risk appetite to dealing with jurisdictions subject to UN sanctions for proliferation concerns. If you're in the US, there's also comprehensive sanctions. So dealings with North Korea, Iran, to the extent that you do them, um, and you may not wish to in this, in, you know, given the risks, you have to have strong controls and, 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 and strong programs around that. Of course, keeping in mind uh, different con conflicts of law situations. So we at MUFG take a very, very restrictive approach to dealing with uh, higher risk jurisdictions. Obviously we, we um, align with all local requirements. But I think first and foremost, get the big stuff right. Um, second, I think uh, it's, and I'm gonna keep coming back to this, it's the blocking and tackling the fundamentals of your program. You have to have a program and that, pro that program, that financial crimes program has to be infused with sanctions, uh, understanding, and that goes beyond lists, right? So when you're doing your customer due diligence, there has to be a sanctions component, which will include a proliferation finance component. 
the risk assessment has to also look at sanctions and proliferation finance. The tools that you have um, are, 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 are many. You know, an institution can exit uh, activities, can exit relationships, can restrict relationships. You can use your filter if you're identifying things that in the course of your research, um, you know, you don't want to deal with. So there are a lot of different tools that you can use um, to, 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 to mitigate the risk. Thanks. So there's, there's plenty available. Um, the question I have next, though, is which are the risks that are hardest to mitigate? Um, what are the things that we have struggled most to deal with? And perhaps I can turn to Maiko first on that. Thank you. So, of course, as we have already learned, any industry could be uh, has a unique risk and has a difficulty to mitigate. But I would draw atten your attention back to the uh, the financial sector and also the manufacturers of the sensitive items. As uh, so, especially like uh, my concern is as, as already John and I mentioned about like uh, the capability of the smaller organizations, smaller country. But here I want to especially emphasize the smaller local manufacturers, smaller local uh, banks that that uh, like, uh, are not fully aware of the risk, and there they can know your customer or customer due diligence resources are limited, and sometimes you rely on the references. That's that could be uh, the inviting new risk. So what happened is one case, the the small uh, one uh, one company sold the second hundred item that eventually used for the sanction invasion, but the, the seller just rely on to the, the who to 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 sell buyer uh, with rely on to the uh, the reference, but like uh, but uh, the the seller did not do their own. Uh, know your customer type of do everything process because the company was small and just didn't have the idea that their item has eventually used for the sanction evasion. So that, that type of like uh, the uh, ca capacity would affect any industry, but particularly in a banking industry and a financial industry, and also this, uh, the manufacturers. So that the government should really uh, uh, contribute to intervene this type of uh, situation. Thing. Okay, so looking behind the financing is one of the most challenging things. It's it's worth me saying before everybody else jumps in that the FATF standards are very specific about sticking with the financing, but but as we've heard, understanding what's in the background can help understand what you need to do on the financing. Um, I want to turn to some of the questions that we've had in the Q&A box now, and there are several, but I'll pick on, uh, there are several about the same subject, which is the low risk side. And there's one from Carola Frank, which is how can countries support DNFPPs and smaller FIs to comply with the new requirements? What are the options that exist for low risk sectors? Um, Yulia, why don't I come to you on this because it's something that we covered in the guidance. Uh, sure, Tom. Thank you. Well, um, of course, uh, the most of the discussion was about the high risks, but indeed, it is very important to bear in mind uh, that um, there are instances and there are institutions and sectors uh, with uh, lower risk or in some cases even very little risks. So. Um, and that may depend uh, on the nature of uh, transactions, customers, uh, profile or, or products and other aspects. And obviously uh, we do not expect a one size fits all approach. It won't work. Uh, we also don't expect uh, countries to measure all financial institutions and all company service providers with the same tape. Uh, while uh, we need also to bear in mind that we need to ensure the full implementation of targeted financial sanctions uh, under Recommendation 7 in any risk scenario. Uh, there are still uh, some possible getaways available in the FATF standards. And uh, in this regard, we expect more nuanced approach here. So first um, possible option uh, under the standards is uh, the flex flexibility for countries uh, to exempt a particular type of covered institutions um, uh, from the new requirements, provided that there is a proven uh, low proliferation financing risk. Uh, 
So uh, the national risk assessment should provide a useful uh, background information here to identify such uh, low risk situations, uh, which could benefit uh, from the exemptions and countries should consider using this flexibility and this will be in line with the standards. However, of course, as risk profiles can change over time and we heard from other panelists that the landscape of risks is evolving and changing, um, countries should of course monitor uh, such exemptions. So uh, the second option also within uh, our standards is um, for the cases where risks are lower, uh, for example, small financial institutions, on the question precisely, uh, for instance, serving locally based uh, and low risk customers. Uh, so there is no ex uh, expectation that these institutions should devote huge additional resources to meet uh, the new obligations. Uh, it would be reasonable, um, for instance, for such institutions to rely on publicly available records and information provided by countries and by the customers for screening against the list, because again, uh, the targeted financial sanctions obligations shall be uh, still implemented in any case. Uh, but um, there is still uh, some uh, level of flexibility for some simplified approach with regard to assessment of risk and risk mitigation. And of course, it, in, in details, it is covered in the guidance. And of course, finally, just a so remark on this topic. Uh, indeed, I guess it's very important uh, to take a balanced approach and focus our efforts uh, where key risks exist. Uh, and also be pragmatic in implementation. And this uh, will help us avoid unintended consequences such as the risking of financial inclusion, which of course is counterproductive. Thank you. Thank you, that's very helpful. And it's a big part of the work we did when we were adopting the standards was to avoid uh, pitching low risk sectors into um, a huge new obligation that they're not ready to deal with. Um, I want to take some more questions from the Q&A box, and we've got a couple that I think are maybe related. Um, one which is about how do you train frontline business staff to be attentive to these risks in the day-to-day -day business? Um, and another which is about beneficial ownership. Um, could the panel speak to the challenges of collecting beneficial ownership information and how it's relevant to proliferation? Um, both of those seem to be about what you're doing in banks um, on these topics. I'm going to ask the panel if anyone wants to volunteer. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to take a stab at it. We, you know, with respect to training the first line, well, how do you do it? Well, you train the first line and you have to come at it from a couple of different uh, perspectives. You've got your, your high level C-suite leadership training, which is focused more on, you know, broad strokes and the overall uh, risk and regulatory environment and, and sort of what you're going to then subsequently be asking their operations and relationship management personnel. So you need that sort of senior level training. And again, going back to program, you need a program, a program for producing this information, a program for refreshing this information. When you're talking about first line personnel that are actually reviewing transactions, well, there you want to um, provide more hands-on training, specific training on risk typologies that needs to be refreshed and it needs to be formal and informal. This is a fast moving space, right? Sanctions come out all the time, new, new information, new reports, they come out all the time. You've gotta be nimble. You've gotta be able to you know, just pull together people and, and do you know, even ad hoc training, which also goes back to people. You have to have the right people. If you're a global financial institution, you have to have people that have experience in this. Uh, both from the banking side and the government side, from the sanctions side, from the money laundering, from the proliferation side. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Thank you. That's very helpful. We've had a number of questions about cryptocurrency or, or virtual assets, as we call them in the FATF standards, and how they're relevant. Um, I want to turn to Maiko. Uh, what's your experience of the use of virtual assets in this space? Sure, as uh, I also uh, explained in the, the earlier session, North Korea is very good at using a currency. Uh, they, they make uh, like fake, fake current cryptocurrency website to invite customer and use it for the, uh, but uh, they actually attack the customer by the, so, or like, and then, but uh, one thing, that's a use of cryptocurrency 
is sometimes beyond the traditional banking channel. That's a very big challenge, but still like a financial industry can still be a good asset to catch the activity because so one case, they, they actually send the money to their physical bank account to cash out, or they bought some like voucher to cash out the the current currency to the real world cash. That's the point that the authority could or bank can get the, the clue or lead to go back to the, the what happened in the virtual world. So that case, the, the role of financial industry is very important to catch the, the underground activity to the real world. Thank you. Thank you. Um and I think, John Annette, you wanted to add something on the beneficial ownership point that we left hanging. Uh, well, thank you, Tom. Um, uh, well, just quick, quick point is, uh, I think at, at this stage in the panel, we, we, we sort of beyond uh, the, the, the sanction list and understood that uh, it's quite unlikely that somebody will uh, uh, name on, on, on the designation list will, will, will come up and uh, for our transactions. So, so uh, beneficial ownership uh, um, and, and more broadly, customer due diligence is, is essential from an actor perspective. Um, th there's also in, in these uh, processes uh, or financial institutional, uh, financial institution processes, a, a way to add a, a layer of proliferation finance. So, um, what, what, what we've been through is a, a sort of misunderstanding that what is good for money laundering and tourism financing will be equally good for proliferation finance. Well, I think there's, there's an extra layer of proliferation finance because you, you won't catch uh, all uh, proliferation suspicious uh, uh, actors if you focus only on money laundering and tourism financing. There's, uh, there's countries issue, there's uh, activities issue, there's behavior uh, thing. And so uh, proliferation finance uh, focus add a sort of a layer of, of due diligence requirement when it comes to, uh, uh, to, to the UBO, which I reckon is, is quite a challenge. And, and that's my last point, actually, to say that this, uh, this is evolving and, and this uh, uh, process of uh, uh, customer due diligence is uh, also has to be reiterated according to risk of, of, of customer, but that is even more uh, pressing with uh, proliferation finance in mind, since uh, uh, panel of experts, for instance, documents how networks are evolving or adapting their, uh, their, their new techniques. Thank you. Um, I have one eye on the clock now because we're almost out of time. Um, I want to very quickly touch on one subject that's in a few of the questions and that, that several of the panel mentioned in brief uh, in passing before we, before we wrap up, and that's public-private partnerships. Um, how governments and the private sector can work together to make all of these risks easier to understand and easier to manage. Um, I wanted to come to Brian and John Annette on this. Um, just what's you've both been working um, on these issues for a number of years and looking at how the public and private sectors are communicating. What's been your experience of the value of PPPs in this area? What can they add? I, so I, I can jump in. I think they're critical. As I pointed out earlier, governments have access to a, a, a much more significant uh, set of data, uh, intelligence, law enforcement information. So information put out by governments is absolutely critical in, in, in informing how financial institutions approach this threat. And there's sort of two levels. Strategically, if governments can produce information on thematic trends, typologies that let me as a bank programmatize and operationalize it. So the identification of certain types of customers, clients, activity, product services, geographies, I can make a program and a control at scale around that. Tactically, providing information on specific networks, potentially through bilateral channels or whatever, that lets me go after things you know, more, more specifically and sort of cut through um, you know, the trillions and trillions of transactions that a globally significant financial institution processes. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. And John Annette? I'm afraid you're still on mute. Um, uh, proliferation finance, when, when, when you look at it, looks like a, an avenue for uh, government and, and private se uh, sector 
sharing of, uh, of information because uh, financial institutions have access to information that the government don't have um, and, and, and quite reciprocally, especially if you look from a strategic level or big picture level from, from a government standpoint and, uh, and uh, uh, detailed information about, um, uh, about companies, about customers, about transaction uh, record that are kept by financial institutions. Uh, so sharing information is essential uh, with obviously the, the, the limitation uh, necessary. Um, I've seen different uh, type of uh, um, sharing mechanisms. So there's a um, sort of formal um, uh, one, like the suspicious activity report, which is uh, sort of one way uh, usually, but there's also uh, more uh, exchanges room or, or, of sharing information in, in uh, uh, like my own, uh, 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 spoke about uh, a, a minute ago. I, I've seen it in other jurisdiction where smaller jurisdiction where there's very informal, almost like a, a sort of WhatsApp group where, where, where they exchange information and they try to communicate quite effectively on, on uh, what what is uh, 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 what, what what should be on the radar. Um, more importantly, I think. Um, answers in 20 seconds or less. Uh, let me go to Brian first. Sure, I'm gonna sound a bit repetitive and like a sports coach here, but fundamentals, blocking and tackling the basics of your program. Sanctions and sanctions evasion considerations have to be baked into the entirety of the financial crimes program in terms of how you do due diligence on your customers, in terms of how you build your risk assessment, and of course, how you manage the sanctions and money laundering programs. You have to approach it holistically. You have to approach it comprehensively. But I do believe that financial institutions um, have the tools to do this, tools that have been built over the last 30 years or so around FATF recommendations and otherwise. So um, I'll leave it at that. Great, thank you. John Annette. Uh, I'd say uh, define PF, uh, scope uh, PF, start, start with the exercise uh, uh, of understanding what, how PF is relevant to you. So, so uh, make it relevant uh, to your uh, jurisdiction or, or, or your institution, and then uh, address those, uh, those, those issues in a in sort of self-reflective uh, uh, manner. And, and obviously my last point, but I might be a bit repetitive here, is uh, share information with government uh, and, 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 and private sector. This, there must be a, a, uh, a way of communicating uh, to, towards uh, uh, proliferation panels. Great, thank you. Over to you, Michael. Thank you. My key part is information sharing, as John Eric said, but uh, particularly sector to sec uh, cross sector, like so trade control and the finance should cooperate on this proliferation finance. And also, of course, they give government to gov private sector and intergovernmental uh, and also international. If the information is staying in one place, then the bad actor would take advantage of the lack of information, period. Thank you. Thank you. Yulia, what's the most important issue to you? Thanks. Well, uh, speaking about why and how, I would say that proliferation financing has long been recognized as a serious threat to international peace and security. And the new requirements with their specific scope and balanced approach shall ensure appropriate implementation of targeted financial sanctions, uh, protecting entities from uh, being illicitly misused. Thanks. Thank you. And let me give the final word to Shlomit. Thank you. Uh, my point would be that we see that the level of sophistication of proliferator is increasing, and therefore it is also relevant to all countries, not only those are in uh, geographical proximity to relevant jurisdictions uh, of proliferation, and that we all need to be familiar with the indicators and improve our ability to identify those cases, both governments and private sectors. Thank you. That's a very good note to end on. Um, I want to contribute one takeaway of my own, which is we've talked about detailed requirements, um, but this is not a box ticking compliance exercise. This is a, a key part of the framework for maintaining global security, and it's helping to keep us all safe. And it's worth remembering that while we're working through a step by step compliance process, what it's all meant to do. Um, we are out of time for today. Um, let me give huge thanks uh, to the experts, the co-chairs, um, and to the audience who've asked very insightful and relevant questions and observations. 
Um, so thank you to everyone, particularly the team behind the scenes at the FATF who've written our guidance and organized this seminar. So Janet Ho and Ashish Kumar and Alex Wijmenga deserve a, a round of applause. Um, we hope the seminar has been a good way and a good step towards understanding how to deal with proliferation financing risks. Um, and please do follow up uh, by looking at the detailed guidance that's on the FATF website, uh, looking at the panel of expert reports, um, and looking at the small but growing number of national risk assessments that are out there and have been published. Um, and we'll be following up on this within the FATF Global Network, and there are a number of other bodies doing work to, to help support uh, implementation in this area. So thank you very much for your time today, uh, and goodbye. <laughs>